It ha- I got it as a gift for my family right before I moved here to Leiden, and it has my teeny tiny little town of like just a few thousand people in Ohio right on the front. Very proudly from, mug is not from 1805. The town's from 1805, which feels really old until you come to a place like Leiden where uh, old is a very relative thing. <laughs> yes, definitely, good point. Thank you for sharing. What about you, Luca? To be honest, I've, uh, I've been doubting till, uh, till now. So I brought a b- bunch of stuff, but eventually I'm deciding for this, um, which, is a, which is a card game. It's called Ooh. Grok. And that's something that I use for, uh, well, I've used a lot for work. I'm a, I'm a coach and I'm, I'm a nonviolent communication trainer. And these cards have helped me a lot in, um, in exploring myself and exploring with my clients because there are two decks of cards. One is, is uh, with feelings and the other one is with needs. So um, apparently we don't have a lot of literacy of feelings and needs and we, we use sometimes yeah. feelings in, in, in a creative way. So these cards have helped me a lot and, uh, has helped, yeah, and, uh, and many of my clients in, in finding out more about our emotional world. That is amazing. Can I pull a card? You want to have a card? Yes. What would you like to have? The feelings or the needs? Feelings. Then you get feelings. And I'll tell you what. I give you some to you and some to you. Oh, thank you. And we can try maybe to get some of your feelings to, right now. Oh, um, I am feeling very excited to share your stories with our audience. So it's this like feeling, a lot of excitement. This feeling you would find in these cards. Yeah? Yeah. Yes, among these cards. I think That's I have. Fantastic. I'm thrilled. <laughs> And uh, so I am, uh, satisfied, choosing satisfied. I'm actually happy to be here as well. Lovely. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. It's a beautiful game. So, um, as the audience knows, we have short profiles into your lives to give a bit of glimpse into your life with our audience. Um, why don't we watch... Uh, where did you take us, Susanna? Hello, Susanna. Where did you invite us? Well, I've invited you today to the Zalport, home of Brasserie de Port, and also home of the place where I got married here in Leiden. Oh, you got married here? I did. Yes. It's honestly, this makes us my favorite place in Leiden because it's where, well, let's be honest, love is what brought me to Leiden. So I feel like it's a symbol for why I love this city. Okay, let's have a look. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I mean, I love the water view, right? I mean, when you're looking out on this big old beautiful canal, like you feel like you could be in the most beautiful place in the world. And when you have a sunny day like this, uh, the green just shines, the old buildings look wonderful. I love it so much. It's a great mix of history and fun. Wow, that's like a tropical heaven. Oh, I know. So it's so beautiful inside. I feel like it's a little piece of paradise. So you speak about your beer collection. Where? it comes from. I realize, you know, some people, they collect keychains or, I don't know, magnets. And I realized, like, I wanted to start some sort of collection to, like, feel a piece of the culture of each of these places I visit. And so I thought, I don't know, for me, I really like alcohol for that because there's such, like, a local flavor that comes from collecting it. Uh, so, for example, I brought a few a bit of a bigger collection at home, although not that big. The pandemic put a bit of a dent in that. Okay. <laughs> um, for example, I went to Breda last weekend for just like a weekend getaway. And we stopped by a place called Frontal Brewery. We love craft beer and I love being able to find that. Of course, I love a good blonde and such, but this to me tastes a bit like home. 
and of course a bit like Brad Ass. I also picked this one up at a teeny tiny like winery in asparagus farm where we were biking through the forest. So that's what I love too, to get these one of a kind things that like, where could I buy this anywhere else? And what's that third one? Oh uh, well of course I didn't have to travel very far to get this one but Franck is my favorite local brewery here in Leiden. What other food places that you often go with your husband? Okay, well first I do have to give a plug for Brasserie de Port. See, I'll be honest, I'm from Ohio, but I have southern roots in America, which means I take seafood very seriously. And this place is truly my favorite seafood place in all of Leiden. Another favorite of mine, it's more of like a hole in the wall kind of secret place you'd find, is uh, Bunga Mas. It's an Indonesian place, um, really close to the Hema on the Harlem Strat. Oh my gosh. I take credit for how good it is because I've introduced it to my Dutch friends, even from different cities, and they love it so much they come here just for this place. What is the most interesting or memorable photograph you have in your phone or in your other collections? Ooh. So it was fun. So I'll admit, for example, when we got married, we actually used one of our best friends to take our pictures. I found for my husband and I, that's when we come the most alive, this was someone we're comfortable with. So I think our favorite pictures were actually just here around the, ha the Haven here in Leiden. We'd sort of hang out near the water and we actually took some really cool pictures where the ph photographer was high above us and we were just standing in the water. And we almost looked like little dolls almost. I don't know how to describe it. Um, but you have such beautiful contrast of scenery in this location. I'd recommend for a photo shoot, whether it's wedding related or just for fun. Wow, Susanna, uh, congratulations on your wedding. Oh, thank you. How long ago was that? It was August 2nd, 2019. Is that a Leidener? No, I did not. I married an Irishman. <laughs> How did you find an Irishman in Leiden? Well, we actually met in America. Oh, wow. Yeah, he did his study abroad at my university in America. And I have to admit, I was actually his uh, orientation counselor. So I showed him around the school and uh, we hit it off. <laughs> For years, we just sort of had to find excuses to visit each other. And it was actually Leiden in the Netherlands, which was the first place we could both come to and move and live together. Amazing. Luca, um, yes. where did you take us? Um, I, I didn't take you very far away from where I was. <laughs> Basically, I took you home. Great. Let's view it. Hello, Hello. Welcome in. What a brilliant day today is. Well, inside is going to be more chilly, yeah? So, you know, like, there is a, inside there is always a temperature of about 3 degrees lower so than outside. What are you doing today? I'm uh, making pizza. Very Italian. Typical, eh? Kind of yes. Well, let's, let's have a look. Come okay, in. so I'll follow you. Yes. Oh. And welcome oh, to my wow. house. What a brilliant place you have. Thank you. What do you like about it? Uh, I like, I mean, who sits there? Oh, who sits there? Oh, that, you know, mostly my daughters. That daughter, that, that chair has made my daughters love me 20% more. If oh, so know. these are the daughters. Can you introduce us to them? Oh, yeah. They, I'm not Who's sure they'll be happy to <laughs> show you this. So this is Olivia. Well, this is for a very long time. Now they are almost 17 and, uh, and 15. So I don't know what the recent picture, if we have recent pictures here. But so, she's Olivia, she's Norma, Norma, Olivia, Norma. And this is your kitchen, so I think your life mostly happens here. This is where I spend most of my time, excluding sleeping. No, yeah, so, but I, I love cooking, yeah, so. Love, what is that? What is that? Uh, do I have to explain what love is? I mean, everything is about love. How come you ended up in Leiden? Oh man, how much time do we have? <laughs> I ended up in London about 20 years ago, um, 20s and a bit. Um, well, like it's just, my story is not very different than many other, many other expats or immigrants. Uh, I come from Italy and already I knew for a very long time that Italy wouldn't, wouldn't be my place for a long time. So as soon as I graduated, you know, me and my girlfriend back in the days, then wife and the next wife, we, we came over here and we found the job. Back in the days, it was fairly it was fairly easy to find a job over here. Now you know it's a bit it's a bit it's a bit different now. Um, How do you keep yourself fit? How do I keep myself fit? Can I see a bicycle? 
or the bicycle or normally stands over there. Uh, how do I keep myself fit? I, well, you keep yourself fit especially through food. Like, let's say, I know because like if we had this interview 10 years ago, you would have interviewed someone with, you know, would weight 105 kilos. So food is a big, is a big, um, plays a big role and I go to the gym. But there is a, this very cliche thing about Italian and Italian food, Italians and Italian food, pasta, pizza, all of them, a lot of carbs. No, I know, I know, that's not me. Oh, by the way, just today, today is Sunday, so today is pizza day, so I've made pizza for today. So there is a, there is something I prepared. <coughs> My God. So pizza dough? So yeah, that's a pizza dough. That is, that has been, uh, that's a, a 48 hours process. So first you let it ferment and then you let it rise. And then now you have to make the, um, it's like these little rolls. That this, they, is, this is natural yeast or the self, uh, the, the instant yeast? It's an instant one, but it's like so little. So eventually you put really like a, a tiny bit because it's... Um, and allow it to process longer. Yes, exactly. So eventually it's going to be very light. So, so we need about, this is too much. I'm going to make this as 600 grams. Yes. If you're talking about pizza, out, apart from your own pizza, what's the best pizza in Leiden? Right, the second best pizza in Leiden is from the guy who taught me pizza, which is, you know, my best friend Enzo. Actually, his pizza is much better than mine. But, um, other than that, there's Don, Don Turi. Don Turi is, uh, you know, well, I've never met the guy, but the guy is from my own town. But it doesn't really matter. He makes the best pizza in town, that's for sure. Don't, I don't actually believe there is a proper Italian restaurant in Leiden, not that I'm aware of. Um, I'm, I might have the disagreement of many Italian restaurants owners in Leiden, but I, um, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I wouldn't know. Coffee, I, um, there is this little place called Angela and uh, run by, um, by Sole, Asia, and they have, they, they have the best espresso in town, as far as I know. So how was the pizza? How was the pizza? Mm. I think you will have to try to, you know, like, because I'm, uh, I'm, I have a conflict of interest in, in telling you how, how tasty it was. Pretty biased, huh? Yeah. Did you bring yeah. us some? Well, you know, the last piece got in, ended last night. So. Uh. <laughs> you gave us a little bit of a glimpse into um, what you do with the nonviolent communication. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit more what nonviolent communication is and how it can solve so much violence that is um, rooting around the whole world? How much time do we have? <laughs> no, Enough it's, time uh, to say a couple no, of things. Nonviolent communication is uh, is huge, and if I if I get started with it, then uh, you know. So I'm going to try to make it as concise as possible. Um, nonviolent communication is a, a, a type of um, a, yeah, it's a type of communication that was originally invented as a as a conflict management tool. <laughs> Um, it turns out that it's much more than that. It's a type of communication that brings us together, so that connects one another, but also connects ourselves with ourselves. Mm. So it's a type of communication that identifies judgment um, and tends to replace it with uh, more empathetic, well, more empathetic words and tone. And, uh, and um, by doing so, you can actually solve pretty much every conflict if you add the equation of time and if you add the equation of patience. Susanna, um, you are teaching international business. International creative business. International creative business. I'll come to the creative part later. Okay. But the, you landed the job in Leiden. Mm. Luca was saying that it was a lot easier um, before to find jobs in Leiden, right? I felt like it, I don't know, was luck or really it was just a lot of networking. Because I'll admit, I got the job maybe 48 hours after landing here. I'll admit, in like the job climate we had today, I thought I'd be looking for a while. But that being said, I arrive on a Wednesday, I get this email on a Friday from a guy named Maurice from a place called In Holland University of Applied Sciences, and I honestly thought it was spam. I was like, who just emails and says, do you want a job? <laughs> but I thought, you know, I'll try it. I went over to their university, I met them, I really liked Maurice, who's my now boss, 
and I met a couple colleagues and basically they had heard about me through my advisor for my master's program because I had a background in arts management. Mm -hmm. and they really needed someone to start teaching in just a couple weeks who could do events, marketing, research. And I thought, I didn't come here to be a teacher, but I can give it a try. Look up. You obviously come from a different culture that has a different way of connecting with people. When you are coaching your clients um, on connection building, do you think your methods are biased by Italian way or you have a universal, more effective way of um, teaching people how to connect better? I've chosen uh, naturally my, my own approach about cultures. I acknowledge cultures as, as a... Um, um, as an element of our own identity, clearly, and yet I, I don't get influenced by it that much. I, I, I rather connect to the human being. Eventually, we, you know, the you know, culture is just a filter after all, right? So it's, um, I find it much more convenient and much more functional to talk to you and talk to you yeah. as human beings independently from the culture you come from, and yet. Culture is very important because uh, it, it defines uh, it defines our values and defines it, it also our social norms. Mm -hmm. And then, if you go beyond that, it's much more interesting for me. Totally. So agree the answer with you. is no. <laughs> <laughs> Not Italian. <laughs> no. And what what does it really mean to be Italian? Right? We're sixty million. If we were all the same, yeah. it means like there would be like an harmonious country, like we would, all, we would all love each other, which it doesn't really correspond to reality, you know, mm -hmm. so. Stereotypes, right? Which our show is all about, breaking those stereotypes. Well, you know, the, the problem I find about. with stereotypes, that from stereotypes you can easily jump into prejudice. Mm -hmm. yeah. From there yeah. you can jump into discrimination. From there you can jump to all the things we, we know that are very divisive in our society. So then let's use culture as, a, as an element of connection. So that inspires curiosity and mm -hmm. not any form of uh, evaluation or judgment or... Susanna, you're teaching creative business development, as you uh, rightfully mentioned. How different is it from regular business development? So it's really interesting. I, admittedly, I think part of the, great, the creativity comes from where our students want to be. So we're training students who either want to be like the creative within maybe a normal business environment mm. that's normal even exist anymore, I don't know, mm. or to be working within a creative sector like television or music mm. or events, um, or really giving them the skills to be those managers in those environments. So rather than being like, say, the singer, they're going to learn to be the manager. Lovely. Um, Luca, a lot of communication uh, is happening digital now, like uh, you, Susanna, mentioned that the normal for the business has changed, yeah. right? Um, so, what kind of opportunities and challenges do you think it is creating? Um, from a communication standpoint, I mean, what is communication if not the willingness to understand each other, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there is no communication without connection, or there is no effective communication mm -hmm. and, um, without connection. What the online, um, what, 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 with, with the old, this new online approach, well, at least what I've learned is the connection is possible everywhere and in any possible way. So, so my, most of my sessions happen online now and yeah. happen throughout the world. And it's amazing how you can connect through a screen. It's like the same, the same way we're connecting to one another now, you know, face to face. That but, to me is the key is the face to face. So I do a, almost exclusively online teaching now mm -hmm. because of the pandemic. And that to me was one of the most difficult parts is when you can't see the other person. Because I agree, it's maybe not 100% the same level of connection you have in person. But I found it really, really hard to say be teaching students and you can't see them. They have like their screens off. I felt like I was just shouting into the void. But once we have the screens on, I felt like we could break down walls much more easily and really feel like a group. So I agree with you, if there's a screen or if there's not, I think it's the faces that yeah, make no, the connection. Eventually, one does not replace the other. And, you know, like the online could be an, an additional tool yeah. to connect, but it's not a limit anymore. You know, like it's, and if you think about how everyone can work from home now, you know, in the past it was considered like a no go. You know, you would have people migrating from a country to another or from, from villages to see big cities because of it was required, the physical presence was required. And for most of jobs, apparently, that proves 
to be not the case anymore for some jobs from some, in some situations I guess that's still fundamental um, but yeah I mean it's, uh, it's the online versus offline mostly is an opinion mm -hmm. and opinions are not facts so facts are saying that things are actually working and yeah. most of the people are really enjoying not to dress up in the morning and not to rush and actually they love it I think I for, love it. for me the most um valuable element of it is more sustainability element that um, yeah there is so much reduction in co2 uh, in terms of not traveling for a conference to another country it's just you're sitting in your home and you cut that uh, emission from happening exactly i'm an events expert in our program and that's been one of the huge observations we've had is this is going to rock the world of events forever because i think sustainability is one of the key changes is we're really now asking ourselves why are we going to have people, thousands of people, fly to this location when we can potentially have just as effective of a get-together that is carbon neutral and cheaper and, yeah, just better for our planet? Absolutely. Um, when you just came here, Susanna, was there any um, communication barrier between you and um, the local Lighteners uh, in terms of language? Oh, yeah. Differences. I mean... I had Duolingo, so that's that's what the kids do now, and like they're getting ready to move. Like I had, like played with my app and had memorized a few key phrases, yeah. but for all intents and purposes, like I didn't really know Dutch when I moved here, and so that was huge. I mean, I'd visited the Netherlands a couple times, so it wasn't entirely foreign to me. But it really struck me once I lived here how much that language barrier was there. Of course, people can speak English. I'll say in Leiden. It, it, encountered very few people who can't switch to English, but it's not the same when you're asking someone to switch versus really participating in mm -hmm. a culture. Um, so I, I found that hard. I still find it hard, to be honest. I used to be so involved in my community. Uh, when I lived in America, that was a big part of my identity, that I loved like you know helping to play in community events and fundraising, and I still don't really feel like I can do that here because I don't speak the language. Um, so that's probably one of the most difficult barriers I still face. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, it's uh, one of the things that many uh, foreigners are facing when they come to a, yeah, a society. I mean, Leiden is a lot easier because majority of Leidners speak, do speak English. Yeah. But then at the same time, participation is the issue, right? So mm -hmm. it takes a longer time to actually start participating in the society's activities. Um, speaking of society, uh, Luca, Many say that Dutch society is extremely polarized. Um, do you agree? And if you think it is polarized, why do you think it is polarized? I can't say whether it's polarized or not. Mm -hmm. uh, I find it difficult that this can ever be um, uh, observable. I mean, in order to, you know, how can you, what, what does it mean polarized, to which extent, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, um, I don't believe uh, in, uh, the, the Dutch society is any different than any other. Uh, let's say when you talk about polarization, for me, what comes in my mind is the idea of right and wrong, mm -hmm. which is the you know the basic of nonviolent communication. There is no non moral no mor from a moral standpoint. There is nothing right or wrong, which doesn't mean there is we got to accept what we don't believe is right, right? Mm -hmm. But it's. Uh, what I find difficult in general is, and, and, and I'm a bit sad about, uh, uh, every situation can become polarized uh, if one part of the society thinks it's right, yeah. because the other, parts, the other part also thinks it's right. So it's un until we create a dialogue, and until we, until we will, uh, we get to a, uh, um, we get to the moment in which we are willing to listen, independently whether we agree or not to the, what the other person, what the other group of person has to say. Mm -hmm. Until the moment we st we stay within our own bubble, in our own bubble, which in our bubble we always right, yeah. right. That means in the other bubble it must be wrong, right? Yeah. And that creates the polarization in which there is no possibility for dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I see this in the Dutch society. I see this in the Italian society. I see it, you know, when I follow the, you know, the U.S. political uh, debate, it's always one or the other. It's right or wrong. Oh. It's left or right. And uh, no, I, 
then I have uh, leave my own bubble where there is no right and wrong. Agreed. And I, I just I listen and I might agree with one part and I, I might agree on the other part, but it doesn't entail, it doesn't imply that mm. it's right. So polarization happens when, uh, when, when we believe we are right. Absolutely. Good tip that, you know, that bubble um, helps us to refrain from polarizing other people. Right? I think it's about it's thinking outside the bubble, you know? You got to pop the bubble and realize that there are so many more perspectives than the ones that were inside your own. It's actually incredible what happens if you, if you really stop and listen empathetically. Mm -hmm. uh, then all of a sudden there is really you go through the right and wrong, you go through the, the duality. Mm -hmm. and, and then there is a space where people understand naturally each other and, and things go in a different direction from there. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Susanna, is it the same in the US in terms of polarization? And I mean, Luca has already referred to the political scene in the US, yeah. but do you think it is happening in the, in the whole society as well? You know, coming from Ohio, it's an interesting perspective. So we used to like to brag, I don't know if this is still true, but we're one of the most average states in America. So much so, like we're the test market capital, which actually I think Leiden's also a test market for the Netherlands, as an aside. That's why they always give away such free stuff in like the station. I loved that. Mm. Anyway, because of that, Ohio's an interesting place to live because it's very average in the sense of you have a pretty half and half mix of very liberal, very conservative, mix of religions, mix of races. So I think that helped growing up there, that of course there was a mix. But that being said, um, I do think you see more and more this sense of like polarizing camps of right and wrong. Um, but I see it more around online dialogue than I do in, in person. Mm. There's of course exceptions, but at the end of the day, if you walk around my small village, it's not like people wear a certain color to be, say what team they're on. Like everyone's pleasant. Everyone feels first and foremost a part of that community before they feel a part of, say, a political party. Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind is what you see on the news is the very sensationalized version. I think people's day-to-day -day lives don't necessarily look like mm -hmm. that. So our last question to both of you. Okay. <laughs> um, since you have moved to Leiden, I know for Luca it has been way longer. Um, have you experienced any stereotypes uh, referring to your birth country? Yeah, of course. <laughs> when, people, when people say, you know, they, you know like, yeah, that happens all the time. And uh, it's funny because, you know, t talking about food, you know, the, 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 immediately the association comes with pasta and pizza, which looking at the video, apparently, you know, yeah, it, happens, uh, it happens in reality, but it's... Um, um, stereotypes, I, I, I realize, often are um, um, a way for people to connect with you. Mm. They try to be funny, <laughs> ways they're maybe not that funny. Uh, one thing that I dislike is when I when they associate Italian Italians with temperament, mm. Um, mm -hmm. which um, implies that Italians get easily uh, nervous or upset. Yeah. I, I, I can I can I can name you many people many certain people who would do that but many others who don't so so again it's a little bit of a, of a way of categorizing label people that you know I don't particularly enjoy yeah definitely How about I, you Susanna not too much all things considered I mean you hear that we're a bit loud and to be honest I'm a bit of a loud person Sorry, can anyway you speak a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> um, no I'd say, I'd say the worst form of stereotyping I've seen recently is have you ever seen America week at Lidl it is all junk food and I feel like that is a, a sad representation of my country yeah. um, but all in all I mean I feel pretty lucky that I haven't had stereotypes really used against me let's say and that's the end of another episode of Hello Leiden we had fantastic guests in our studio um, hope you enjoyed their stories as well. Um, one a note at the end of our show, um, last Saturday, um, Leiden has experienced something very sad. And as a Hello Leiden team and Slotestad um, team, we would like to express our condolences to the family and loved ones of our little angel who passed away. Um, we are really sorry that uh, it happened and we hope that um, they will be measures taken not to repeat the same again. Well, have a good evening 
Dat was samen met Sonova voor Hello Leiden, Slotestaat TV. Hello Leiden. Hello Leiden. Goedemiddag met de Leiden. Zdravstvo Leiden. Hello Leiden. Bonjour Leiden. Hello Leiden. Marhaba Leiden. Ciao Leiden. Hi, podai Leiden.